Merci tout le monde d'être euh, du rendez-vous pour ce séminaire de mathématiques physiques. Uh, thanks for coming today. It's our pleasure to have uh, Raphael Nepomeshi from Miami University. Raphael is a string theorist by training, but an expert in integrability under all its forms, uh, which includes quantum spin chains. Um, and he has also interests in quantum information measures. Um, and today the talk will be uh, along those lines where it's combining the ansatz and quantum computing ideas. So uh, without further waiting, uh, Rafael, uh, please take the mic. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you uh, everyone for tuning in. Good afternoon, everyone. So, right, uh, the title is uh, Beta Ansatz and Quantum Computing. So these two topics don't often appear in the same sentence. Uh, I'll try to convince you uh, that uh, maybe they should. And in the talk, I will not assume familiarity with either one of these topics. But uh, before I go on, I'd like to give a special thanks to Luke and uh, all his research group and the CRM staff. Uh, that made my stay here at the CRM uh, most enjoyable. And also I'd like to acknowledge the Simon CRM grant for financial support. Okay, so uh, an outline of the talk. So I'd like to begin with an introduction to the Heisenberg quantum spin chain, and then uh, a brief review of beta ansatz. And, and then uh, this will be the, the, the main part of the talk. It'll be uh, on... Uh, using quantum computer to construct so-called beta states. And I'll explain what those are. And in this part, I'll focus on, on three papers. So uh, recent ones. So uh, this first one, uh, I think is a very interesting paper. Unfortunately, I'm not one of the authors. Uh, I'll, I'll explain uh, what they do. And then two of my own uh, works that are kind of follow-ups to, to this one. And then uh, at the end, a very brief outlook on the subject. And please, if at any point uh, you have any questions or comments, just feel free to jump in. So a uh, Heisenberg quantum spin chain. So this is a deceptively simple model of magnetism that was uh, introduced by a young Heisenberg at the, at the dawn of quantum mechanics. And the basic idea is you have uh, uh, N, uh, or sorry, L, spin a half spins arranged in a circle. And uh, these uh, spins can interact uh, with their nearest neighbor. So like this guy can interact with this one and also with this one. And uh, their interactions are governed by this Hamiltonian. So let me break it down for you. So, so these sigma Ns means that we have at, uh, we have L sites, which will number from zero to L minus one. And then uh, at the end site, we have uh, poly matrices. And then all the other sites, we have the identity matrix. So more precisely identity, meaning a two by two identity matrix. And these sigmas are the, the three familiar poly spin matrices, sigma X, sigma Y, sigma Z. So that's what these sigma ends are. And then um, here we have a dot product, which means uh, you have j, j, and you sum over j. So sigma x, sigma x, plus sigma y, sigma y, plus sigma z, sigma z. And uh, what else? Oh, yes. Yeah. So here, uh, when this uh, subscript n becomes the top, l minus 1, we have uh, sigma l, which is uh, beyond this. So sigma l just means sigma 0. So in other words, we have periodic boundary conditions as in the figure. And, um, and, and so we see that this is uh, just a, a two to the L by two to the L matrix. And I'd like to argue that uh, this, uh, I'd like to say that this Hamiltonian is, uh, this model is uh, perhaps one of the most important models in theoretical physics. It, can be realized experimentally, and it appears in many, many contexts, uh, including uh, has connections with conformal field theory, with ADS, CFT, and well, there's a very long list of things where, where this model just appears. 
Um, and, and the problem, uh, or one problem you could ask is given this Hamiltonian, what are the eigenvalues uh, and eigenvectors to solve this problem? Uh, but as you see that uh, the matrix is growing exponentially with the size. So if you just wanna put it on a computer uh, and ask for the eigenvalues, this kind of brute force uh, way won't take you very far. You, you, can't, you can't get to very long chains this way. And, and that's why I emphasize this word deceptively that it looks simple, but it's not so simple. Okay, so that's the model uh, introduced uh, back then. And, and now I'd like to review um, something called beta ansatz, which was uh, found by beta just a few years after the model was introduced by Heisenberg. And uh, the solution that um, he found is now known as coordinate beta ansatz. And that's what will be important for the talk. So the, the main idea of beta is that the eigenvectors of this Hamiltonian are multi-particle states known as magnets. So um, let's uh, again, break this down. So we can start from the, the ground state of the model, which is a state with no magnets, no particles. And I'll denote it here by the state zero, which is just, um, uh, L, L uh, fold tensor product of one zero. So we would say spin up at every site. And you can easily check that the Hamiltonian I showed earlier is an, uh, 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 that this is an eigenstate of that Hamiltonian with eigenvalue zero. Uh, then we can have one particle state. So the way to, to create those is you, you flip one of these spins at uh, site X, uh, you weigh this uh, vector with a weight e to the i k X, and you sum over all the lattice sites from X equals zero to L minus one, and denote that state by psi of K. So it turns out that this state um, is with, with one overturn spin, which corresponds to a one particle, is an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian with an eigenvalue I'll call E of K, which is given, uh, given here. And uh, we'll be using this notation later, so uh, let's remember. And we can think of this as the one particle energy. But uh, this is not true for any value of k. The, uh, it's only true provided the k satisfies this condition, e to the i k l is equal to one. So for those values of k, this guy is an eigenstate with this eigenvalue. All right, that's the one particle state. Uh, two particle states are a little more complicated. So now you have two overturned spins, uh, one at site x0 and one at site x1. Uh, and then you should weigh uh, that, uh, that vector in this way. So here you have e to the i k0 x0, k1 x1. And here the same thing, but the zero and one are, are permuted. You sum over all the lattice sites. Uh, what I haven't told you yet are these coefficients, which uh, don't depend on, on k or x. Sorry, they do depend on k, but not on x. Uh, they're given by, by this formula here. So a one zero is related to a zero one uh, in this way, where s, uh, is defined like this. And u is a function of k given by this. So it's a little complicated, um, but it's a, it's a very explicit function. And it's useful to think of this uh, as uh, a two particle S matrix. So this is, uh, think of this as a space time diagram. Um, so uh, say uh, space this way and time this way. So you have these two particles and they're, they're moving in one dimension, but, uh, and then, but at some point they will cross, they will, and then, uh, but, uh, and then they'll keep going. So uh, this is um, uh, a process in which the momenta don't change, okay? Uh, but, uh, but they pick up a phase given by this S matrix. 
And it turns out that uh, this state here uh, is also an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. And the eigenvalue is simply given by the sum of the one particle energies I showed you on a previous slide. Again, it's not true for any values of this K0 and K1. There's a condition and actually two conditions and they're given here and they depend on this, on this S matrix. So if you can solve uh, this pair of equations for K0 and K1, uh, then you can just plug into here, you get your eigenvector and plug into here to get the eigenvalue. Okay, finally, the M particle state is just basically gen a generalization of this one. So what we do is, um, well, it'll depend on M uh, different Ks, K0 to Km minus one. And then, uh, Notice that in the two particle case, we had two terms in the sum. Now we have m factorial terms because we're summing over all permutations of uh, zero to m minus one. And um, each one's going to come with some coefficient that depends on the permutation. I'll, I'll spell that out in a minute. Epsilon p is just the signature of the permutation, plus or minus one. Um, Yes, and then this vector here uh, has, uh, as you expect, uh, m overturned spins at positions x0 to xm minus one. We sum over all of them. And then uh, we have this uh, weight, k0, x0, km minus one, xm minus one. But then um, when, we, when we put here, we'll, we'll sum over all possible permutations of the, um, of the of the case, that's what that, that's what what this notation means. <clears throat> and then these coefficients a p are related again by this s two two particle s matrix. So uh, knowing the just the two particle s matrix, you can get uh, all of these uh, all of these coefficients here. This is kind of the quite miraculous that you don't have any, you don't really need anything else except the two particle less matrix. You'll just get a bunch of, a uh, bunch of products of them uh, to give the coefficient for, for, uh, for these vectors. All right, that's, uh, oh, and then, uh, so the statement is that this vector constructed this way will be an eigenvector of the Heisenberg Hamiltonian, the corresponding eigenvalue E, is just going to be given by the sum of the uh, individual uh, one particle energies. Whoops. Uh, but again, it's not true for uh, arbitrary Ks. They should satisfy a set of equations. So actually M different equations, uh, and they're, they're spelled out here. Um, and I should say that uh, this state uh, is called the beta state. And this set of equations is called the beta equations. So again, to summarize, uh, if you can solve these beta equations for the Ks, you can plug in here to get the beta state and plug in here to get the corresponding energy eigenvalue. So um, I'm sorry if that was a little fast, but I, I hope uh, you get the idea. And, and this is an exact solution. There were no approximations that were made. And this is what uh, this is what beta found. Um, just uh, to go a little bit further with this, uh, this model has SU two symmetry. It's not hard to show, and as a result, uh, the eigenvalues are not of the Hamiltonian are not uh, are, are degenerate. They're not distinct, and it turns out that the degeneracy is given by L, the length of the system minus two m, and the number of particles or overturn spin plus one. And also it's not hard to show that the number of overturn spins or particles M must be less than or equal to L over two. So just to show you how all that works, let's do a, a simple example. Let's consider the case where the, the length of the chain is four. 
So according to, to this, M can either be zero, one, or two, right? Half of L is, is two, that's the maximum. So um, let's make a table. So in the first column, I'll put the M value. Uh, second column, the, the Ks, the solutions of the beta equations. Here are the corresponding energies. And here are the degeneracies given by, by this formula. So in the first row, uh, M equals zero. That means that's the ground state. So no Ks, zero energy. And according to this formula, it's uh, four minus zero plus one. So degeneracy five. Then for uh, next case is M equals one. And it turns out there's three solutions of the beta equations for M equals one. So one of them is one half pi, one of them is three halves pi, and the other one is pi. So for each of them, you can compute the energy and the given here. And according to this uh, formula, the degeneracies of these guys are all three. So for example, this two appears three times, this two also three times. So in fact, two appears six times and so on. And finally, when M equals two, it turns out there's two solutions of the beta equations. This one's a little bit uh, strange. Um, let me not talk about it. And then there's this one. And then uh, the energy is given here and the degeneracy, well, these are, these are not degenerate, so one. And if you sum these numbers, you'll, you'll get 16, which is two to the four, which is two to the L. So in other words, we've accounted for all 16 eigenvalues of this Hamiltonian. And so we see that uh, the beta ansatz, at least for this example, is complete. We can account for all the eigenvalues of, uh, of the Hamiltonian. And that's basically how, how, how it works. So um, a few remarks. Um, so uh, if you write down some generic Hamiltonian, it's, it's not gonna have this kind of amazing solution. This solution is possible only because the model is quantum integrable. Um, it turns out that there are infinitely many such models corresponding to solutions of the Yang-Baxter equation. And, and the model which I'm showing here, this Heisenberg model is just uh, one of the simpler examples. Actually, it's kind of a prototype of quantum integrable models. Uh, also, I want to emphasize that the beta equations are generally hard to solve. So as far as I know, the complete set of solutions of the beta equations for the Heisenberg model is known only up to uh, 14 sites. So not so high. Uh, moreover, um, uh, significant effort is generally still required to explicitly compute quantities of physical interest. So if you want, um, I said these models can actually be physically realized. You, uh, experimentalists know how to make these quasi one dimensional systems and they can make measurements. But if you wanna compare results of the measurements to the theory, you still have to do a lot of work. Uh, uh, and this is what I'm trying to say here. So even though uh, everyone refers to this. Uh, I have a quick question, oh, yeah. if I may, about this L equal to 14. So could you clarify what's the limitation? Because uh, if you were to put in the, the equations in a computer, presumably 14 is not the limiting case today, or maybe uh, I misunderstood the. So, so, um, so uh, said maybe this was already almost ten years ago, but uh, but um, yeah, the matrices are are large, right? Two to the fourteen, but uh, but uh, but the beta equations. Um, so here, uh, actually, the beta equations you have uh, the maximum m is half, so seven. But uh, yeah, you think it's not so hard, but uh, but you have a system of. Um, of, of seven, um, right, seven uh, uh, equations with uh, seven unknowns and the powers are, are high and, and well, it, it's, it's very hard to solve these equations. So, so actually the, my, my co-authors here, um, uh, Sumezi and Howe, these are mathematicians, uh, 
who uh, do um, uh, computational algebraic uh, geometry, and and they they invented uh, Somazi invented um, a software package called uh, Bertini, and what they do is um, something called homotopy continuation. And uh, which is seem to be the, the state of the art for solving um, such systems of, of polynomial equations. So basically you, 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 you insert a parameter in the beta equation so that when the parameter say is zero, the equations are trivial to solve. And then you adiabatically uh, move the in, increase the parameter until it becomes one, at which point the equations are the true beta equations and you follow um, each of the solutions, and some of them go to infinity, some of them spiral around. I mean, the behavior of these solutions is very complicated as you, as you do this uh, homotopy continuation. This clever software can, can track all these things, and, and that's as far as they could get. <laughs> so I don't know, maybe there's better methods, but uh, at the time, this seems to be, the, whoops, that seemed to be state of the art. So just, just a quick question there. That's for computation of the beta parameters, but the fact that they're complete, that you have two to the L, that is proved, isn't it? I think for, I think by now it's proved for, for certain models. Like I think maybe for Heisenberg, it's proved, probably, uh, probably so. Yvonne, didn't you have a hand in that? Actually, Yvonne is, I don't think is here. He, he oh, I think he and Langlands actually provided a proof. Okay. Um, uh, Okay, uh, I, is he, he'd be better to say, probably. I mean, usually you have to be very careful about um, what you mean. So, so there's a lot of details which I glossed over. For example, um, here I assume that uh, when I talk about a solution, I assume that no, no, two, no two beta roots are equal. Uh, I don't know if that was, um, so that was an assumption. Uh, I don't know, um, maybe that's also, maybe Yvonne also proved that. Um, so there are a number of things that, um, that uh, also I, I think I've seen some proofs. I, I don't know Yvonne's proof, uh, but I've seen some proofs where they don't exactly solve this model, but they introduce uh, inhomogeneities. So the Hamiltonian is not SU2 invariant, uh, but, uh, so if you introduce inhomogeneity, it's actually the problem becomes simpler. But for the SU2 case, uh, I think it's a little hard, but, but indeed there, there may be proofs by now. Uh, I don't know them, but- I, th I think there are proofs for quite a number of representations. So the spin a half case, I think is proof. But yeah. uh, okay. there are other, other uh, quantizations where you could have spin, I mean, where you could have spin other one. representations than the, the up down. Mm -hmm. Uh, and th many of those are also proved. I've forgotten the name, but uh, uh, there were two. Uh, there were two authors who who proved a whole sequence of uh, completeness uh, results. Okay. So, um, so what I was saying, beginning to say that even though uh, people will call this uh, exact solution, I'd rather call it exact half solution because you're really only halfway there to 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 really solving the problem, being able to compute quantities of physical interest. And, uh, and so here's where, where quantum computers maybe can help. Uh, we know quantum computers can help solve many things, we, many problems that we can't solve using classical computers. Maybe, maybe they could help here. So that's the, that's the dream. And, um, and, and this is what I'd like to explore in the rest of the talk. So uh, before I go on, let me define what I mean by a quantum computer. So uh, I think of it as a device with uh, n qubits, and a qubit is just a, a two-state system, can be realized in many different ways. And uh, each qubit can be initialized in the state, which I'm sorry, I'm gonna call now zero, which is just uh, the state one zero. And uh, you can perform on this qubit uh, unitary transformations 
using uh, so-called uh, gates, quantum gates. And uh, at the end, you can perform projective measurements, which will project uh, the qubits onto either the state zero or the state one, which is the state zero one. And these are known as the, the computational basis. So um, currently the, the devices that are uh, available have on the order of uh, 10 to the two qubits. And, and these are produced by uh, IBM, Google, and uh, other companies. Uh, but uh, these devices are noisy. They make a lot of errors. So the, the dream is that uh, hopefully in the not too distant future, uh, we'll have available devices with say 10 to the four qubits that'll be fault, tor fault tolerant. And um, they'll be able to make precise calculations. But uh, for the moment, uh, we don't have those. But in the meantime, we can test algorithms. Uh, so uh, in the meantime, uh, we can test algorithms or so-called quantum circuits using uh, simulators, which are noiseless, or we can arrange them to be noiseless. And in the work I'll describe, I used, um, uh, we use the IBM uh, simulators, uh, which are, are called, uh, the package is called Qiskit. Uh, and uh, for these simulators, the number of qubits is around, the maximum number is around 30. So uh, we are limited to, to that. So could I slip in a quick question again? Please, yeah. So in these actual uh, configurations, what did you say, two to the 10? You said a certain number of qubits in oh, the IBM computer. the N is uh, 10 to the four. 10 foot, okay. So my, my question is, is this That's, actually sorry, the fantasy. like- That's the dream, right? Okay, but the question is, are these, so it's 10 square, uh, are these complex linear combinations or real? Oh, uh, yeah, complex. Okay. Yeah, so you can, you can make any unitary transformation. I mean, in, pr in principle, I mean, you have to, you have to figure out how to do it uh, using gates. And uh, I mean, I wasn't going to go into details about that, but um, so the gates that are at your disposable at disposal are either one qubit gates or two qubit gates, and uh, and these two qubit gates are actually very specialized. Usually, uh, in the usually people use what are called C not gates. So in principle, just using these gates, you can you can get arbitrarily close to an arbitrary unitary transformation, but you may need many many gates. And well, the more gates you use, the noisier things get. But um, but yeah, in principle, you could you could do any unitary transformation. I was only asking because there was actually an article in Nature not long ago, which was trying to compare the results of real versus complex quantum mechanics using mm -hmm. such things. Mm. And uh, anyway, so I guess we all believe in complex. So I'm happy to hear yeah, that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so uh, so now I'd like to describe uh, uh, this uh, recent work by Van Dyke and company from Virginia Tech. And so their idea was to solve the beta equations classically for real Ks. I, I said earlier that um, it's hard to solve beta equations in general uh, sort of for complex Ks, but if you restrict all the Ks to be real, it's actually easy. There's a uh, very uh, nice classical algorithms that allow you to do that for actually very large values of M. You can go to thousand. So, um, so this is not hard to do classically. And so, um, so the idea was, okay, let's do that using classical computers, but then use quantum computer to construct the exact eigenstates using the coordinate beta ansatz, which I described uh, at the beginning of the talk. And, and this is something which is classically hard. So the idea would be to do this part on a quantum computer. And, and they uh, provided an, uh, an algorithm that'll do exactly that. So let me uh, try to describe uh, their algorithm and I'll do it uh, in pictures. So a schematic diagram of the quantum circuit that they proposed. 
So if you haven't seen one of these, you, you just read it from uh, left to right. Okay. And uh, so it starts here. And so, um, so this corresponds to um, L qubits, in, and they're all initialized in the state zero. And we'll refer to them as the system qubits. So uh, at the end of the day, these qubits here, when you get to the end here, will be in the beta state, the, the state you want to construct, this guy here. But in addition to this, uh, we need some uh, additional qubits. So m squared qubits, uh, which will also be initialized in the state zero. Uh, these are called, for a reason you'll see in a minute, permutation label qubits. And then an additional set of qubits, m qubits, will be called faucet qubits, and they're also initialized in the state zero. So initially, all the qubits, uh, and there's L plus M squared plus M of them, they're all initialized in the state zero. These qubits here uh, in the literature would be referred to as ancillary qubits or ancillas. Uh, they're necessary for performing the calculation, but at the end of the day, uh, you don't see them. Okay, so this is where the how it starts. And then the, the first step uh, of this algorithm is to prepare so-called Dick state. Uh, so we prepare the system in the Dick state. And the Dick state is, is simply this state here, which means that you, you overturn M spins at positions X zero up to XM minus one, and you sum over all these uh, positions and you weight it like this so that this data is gonna be normalized to unity. Interestingly, uh, quantum computer scientists were interested in, in these states already uh, for other reasons. And, and they found deterministic algorithms for preparing them. And, and uh, actually there's many papers, but these are just um, a sampling. So this was already known. Then the next, and but you'll already recognize that this is something that appears in, in, the, in the beta state. Then the next step here is to create uh, uh, so-called permutation labels and apply the phases epsilon p and ap that I, I mentioned uh, at the beginning. So in other words, we want to prepare this state where the state p encodes um, one of the m factorial possible permutations, and we sum over all the permutations. I won't go into details about um, how we, how it's done, but it's just uh, some way of encoding permutations using m squared qubits. The next step is to apply the phases uh, e to the i uh, k p um, to the permutation label qubits, and in order to do that. Uh, uh, this group also needed these ancillary qubits, they called faucet qubits. And then uh, the next step was to basically apply the inverse of this step, but without the phases. And, uh, and that's almost the end, whoops. Uh, if, if at this point you, you look, you ask yourself, what's the, the state of the quantum computer at this step here? what you'll find is that it's given by a linear combination of many vectors, but one of them uh, is a vector where the qubits here are in the state phi tilde, which is the desired normalized beta state corresponding to, to, to these values of K. And then all the ancillary qubits are in the state zero. And alpha is just some coefficient. That's going to be one of the many terms in, in the sum of the state vector at this point. And so the, the last step is to measure the, so I should have said that um, already at, at, after you apply this, uh, this step, the faucet qubits are already back into their initial state. They're all uh, in the zero state, but the qubits uh, are, uh, the permutation label qubits are not. So you measure those. And if the result, oops, I'm sorry. Yeah, so if you, after you measure the permutation label qubits, um, if all of them uh, are in the zero state, then you know that uh, the, the, the state of the computer must be 
the system qubits, these guys here, must be in the state phi. Okay, so, um, and so we've succeeded. So, um, so at this point, um, uh, we have success and we're happy. Excuse uh, me, I may, may ask a question. Uh, you, you said about alpha is just some coefficient, but as if it, as if it didn't matter, of course, your success probability will be the square norm of alpha. So how, how small is alpha? How big is it? How, what's your probability of success? If you don't know... Thank you very much for the question. This is a perfect question. Uh, I'll answer in a minute. So, so, um, so, whoops. Um, so, uh, so the first point before we get to alpha, I, I want, and as you already mentioned, um, what you what you see is that this algorithm is not deterministic. It's probabilistic. So, um, so you have to run it uh, a bunch of times until um, until until the uh, ancilla qubits are along the state zero. So. When they get to that state, then you succeed. So it's a probabilistic or, uh, algorithm. And, and right, uh, as was said, um, there's a success probability associated with this algorithm and it's given by the modulus of alpha squared. So right, the, the, the wonderful question is, so what is it? So when, when uh, these people wrote their, uh, wrote their paper, um, they didn't have a formula for it. So the only way they could uh, compute it is by just running it on a, on a, on a simulator and not even a, a kind of physical simulator that does shots. It's what's called the state vector simulator, which actually produces the state vector, which is not something that will happen on a real quantum device. So it's kind of cheating, but this is the only way they could compute the success probability. But then, so, um, so I asked myself, well, is this something we can compute? And um, yeah, what's its value? And um, so in a recent paper with uh, two of my students, we, we computed it. And, and the formula is, is, is surprisingly compact. It's given here. So it depends on L, on M, and a matrix, the determinant of a matrix G. And this uh, G is uh, actually a famous uh, quantity in, in, the, in the business of quantum, uh, in beta ansatz quantum integrability, it's called the Godin matrix. So what it is, it's uh, an M by M matrix. And uh, if you want to take a look at it, it's not complicated. Uh, it's given here, it depends just on the, uh, on the beta roots K. So, the idea, so this notation is defined here. And so it's a very simple quantity. You can put it on the computer. Uh, you can, you, once you know the case, you can compute it and, and, and then you know what this is. So that's the, uh, that's the success probability. So is it diagonal? No. Uh, what does the delta part, M mean? Yeah, that's this part, but this part here is not diagonal. There's a diagonal oh, oh, part and there's a non-diagonal part. Right. So, um, so one of the, the nice things about having this formula is that now you can study um, how, this, how things scale, uh, what happens when the, the size of the system grows, the large L at fixed M. And we argued in this paper that, uh, the, that uh, unfortunately, the success probability at large L goes, it falls as one over M factorial. So as m, the number of uh, particles, the number of magnons grows, uh, this success probability is going to zero very, very fast. And we also check this numerically. So here we have success probability as a function of L. And, and, you, uh, and this is for different values of m. So for m equals one, success probability is one, right? So 100%, but as you like here, m equals two, it's already at the one over two factorial. So one half, still not too bad. M equals three, it's getting small. M equals four, getting really small. And yeah, it, it, it plateaus very quickly. So, um, so consistent with this. So, so that was um, uh, one of the results we found. And, and also we asked ourselves, uh, what could we hope to compute using this circuit? Because that was also something that was not really addressed in the original work. 
And so uh, first thing that comes to mind is, well, how about um, spin-spin correlation functions? This is something which is notoriously difficult to compute uh, analytically. So can we do it using this algorithm? Um, so more, more precisely, we're, we're interested in this. So sigma z at site zero, sigma z at site L, where little l can go from one to l, big L over two. And um, now for the ferromagnetic uh, state, uh, this is trivial, but for the antiferromagnetic state, this is not trivial. And so we, we looked at the antiferromagnetic ground state. In other words, the same Hamiltonian as before, but with a minus sign. So uh, this is the antiferromagnetic uh, ground, uh, ground state. And it turns out that this one is described by M uh, equals L over two real beta roots. So the maximum possible number of beta roots. Whoops. Um, so, uh, so the way you would wanna, you could compute it on a, on a real device would be to perform multiple shots. So, so you perform uh, multiple experiments uh, and, and, um, and you, you measure uh, uh, this thing for each shot and then you have to just do multiple shots to, in order to get a reasonable value for the correlation function. So first question is how many shots do we need to perform? So um, we, we argued that um, if you want your answer within an error epsilon, then you, the number of shots n that you need should be less than or equal to some maximum number. And that maximum number depends on the success probability I told you about recently, and then also epsilon squared. Again, epsilon is the error. Whoops, and, um, and I also, okay, when you perform the shots, how do you uh, compute this expectation value? So usually uh, uh, you, would, you would use some built-in functionality in the, uh, say, Qiskit to, to perform the expectation value. But, uh, but here um, we can't do that because uh, as I uh, argued before, the state here is produced probabilistically. So not deterministically. So the usual built-in functionality um, won't won't do. Um, uh, but um, it's not hard to see that you can proceed by measuring all the qubits and then appropriately combining the corresponding probabilities. Maybe since uh, time is getting short, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll skip this part. Okay, so. So, uh, so then let's, let me show you the results that we found on, on the simulator. So we were interested to compute uh, this spin-spin uh, correlation function. And uh, let's, we, we put our results in a table. So, um, so because, the, as I mentioned, the simulator is limited to 30 qubits, we can only go up to size, uh, to L is equal to eight. So here's L equals four. I, I'll fill in the rest of the table, but here we'll put L equals four. L equals six, L equals eight. And, um, and uh, so using the, um, the formula I showed you earlier for the success probability. Um, oh, and I should emphasize that uh, maybe it went a little fast that since we're talking about the antiferromagnetic ground state, uh, M always here is L over two, right? So, uh, so so for this value of M and this value of L, you can compute the success probability. So in this case, it was 0.5. In this case, it's getting small, right? Because M is getting bigger, 0.15, and here getting really small. And so using a formula I showed you again earlier, from this, you know how many shots you need to perform the measurement. So here, um, two times 10 to the four here, so L equals six, 6.4 times 10 to the four, and here 10 to the five. And um, so we demanded to get 1% uh, error in the correlation function. So we, we, we just arbitrarily chose epsilon to be uh, 0 0.01. Um, sorry, so, uh, so yeah, so that actually came into the calculation of these numbers. So I was going a little fast. 
And so what we did is we performed 100 trials of N shots uh, with no noise. And we, we performed, this also number is, is kind of arbitrary, but we wanna get enough statistics so that we can compute the standard deviation and, 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 comp and compare with uh, this epsilon that we're, we're demanding. Yeah, and as I already said that uh, the success probabilities are, are going down uh, as we increase in L and therefore the number of shots we need uh, given by this formula is, um, is increasing. And, uh, and so here's the results. So uh, these are the results for L equals four, uh, results for L equals six and results for L equals eight. And so one thing you can, uh, and the statistics, so this is the mean and the standard deviation from the 100 trials. And, um, and so you can see that the uh, standard um, deviations are consistent with this 1% uh, error that we, uh, that we imposed. And, um, and now I introduced another column, which is the theory column. And you can easily compute these correlation functions, say with Mathematica, and, and this is a result uh, here. So this is exact. And you can see that um, the experimental values are not too bad uh, compared to the exact results. So, so basically it, it's working. And, and just for curiosity, I, I put here also the uh, infinite site result, L equals infinity. So these are uh, notoriously difficult calculations. Um, so for, for little L equals one, it was done in 38. For little L equals two, it was done in 77. For three in 2003 and four in 2005. And these are the results. And you can see that for L equals one, little L equals one, the eight sites is not too far from the uh, infinite, but as you as uh, as you go to higher little l's, remember little l is here. How far away the the two the two spins are, then then you see you're getting further away. So to get a more accurate number, you uh, you, you need to go to higher, uh, bigger size uh, chains. And I just interpose a rather naive please, question please. on the principle of the quantum computing. Okay. Result. Mm -hmm. uh, as you said, everything is probabilistic. So are these numbers exact numbers or are they expectation values? So, so, so this is, uh, so, uh, well, th these numbers here are exact, the theory ones, but uh, the numbers here that we're getting from the, and this is not really a quantum computer, it's a simulator, of, of, but it would, it's behaving like an ideal quantum computer so you'd have to perform many, many shots, well, these numbers. And, and if you want more precision, then you need to make more shots, right? This is the, the number of shots you need to make to get the precision you want. I, I don't so, know if that so answers. The, so your, your calculation <clears throat> with the simulator it, uh, it, is, uh, is, an, is one which can be made arbitrarily precise, or is there always some probabilistic error? Well, you it, it won't. I mean, you won't get infinite precision because then you need an infinite number of shots, right? But uh, so, but but if you're willing to do enough shots, then in principle, you, you you could have you know very very small error. And that is the error introduced by the quantum computer. No, no, this is just um, the error because. See, the quantum computer doesn't actually compute um, the, the eigenvector. It just does, uh, it just uh, performs shots. It, it, and so you have to, uh, and each shot has a certain probability of, of getting, uh, you know, you, you can get an estimate for this, for this result, but um, you don't always get the same thing, right? So, so, uh, so I want to uh, say that I'd like to argue that just from, from looking at this, we see that the correlation functions for small values of L, small chains, is feasible. But on the other hand, for small L, you don't need a quantum computer because you can just easily do it with Mathematica, right? So what you really want is for 
moderately large L uh, where you cannot do it with a classical computer. But unfortunately, you also can't do it with a quantum computer, at least using this algorithm. Uh, because um, uh, as I, I said, uh, this success probability is decreasing exponentially with the size of the, of the system. Right, so if I look at the log of the success probability, it's 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 really uh, it's going down very very fast, and so so for example, uh, for a, a chain of size forty is not that big, and yet the success probability would be ten to the minus twenty, and so uh, so and this is talking now on an ideal device, so you'd need ten to the twenty three shots, which is totally uh, out of the question. So, so unfortunately, um, you, this will not, uh, you won't be able to calculate ground state correlation functions of the antiferromagnetic uh, ground state uh, in this way. So that's the bad news. Uh, nevertheless, it should be feasible to use this quantum circuit to study other states with small values of M, which would correspond to some excited states of the model. And you could do this even for moderately large L values because that it, the success probability uh, is independent of, uh, of, uh, of L, basically. Okay, I wanna say in the closing minutes a little bit about open spin chains, that is spin chains with boundaries um, because so far I was talking about periodic chains. So spin chains with boundaries are also of interest both experimentally and theoretically. And, and this is work I did with this Virginia Tech team. So the Hamiltonian, for example, would be this one, which is the same as the one I showed you in the beginning. The only difference is, the, is this. So instead of going to L minus one, where this guy talks to the last one, talks to the first one, you just chop it off at L minus two. So, um, so we don't have periodicity. It looks like just a very simple change in the problem, but actually that's also deceptive. Uh, it turns out there's a non-trivial generalization of the formalism for the closed spin chain. And this, uh, again, Godin enters a story. He, he, he's the first one who thought about this, and it was generalized for the X Z case uh, by Alcaraz, Batchelor, Baxter, and, and others in this nice paper. And uh, let me just illustrate the, the problem. If I look at the, at the, the system with just uh, two magnons, m equal two, the, the beta state looks uh, rather complicated already. Um, so you'll recognize uh, these two terms, they were, they were already there in the case of the periodic spin chain, okay? But you get a bunch of additional terms, these in red, and you notice what they're doing like if I look at this one, it's the same as this one, but I take the K zero and I send it to minus K zero, both here and here. This guy I get by taking this guy and sending K one to minus K one here and here. Here I send both K zero and K one to the minus, and then I have to flip the sign and so on. So in general, uh, the eigenstates are given by now by this formula. Uh, you don't have to look at the details. The, the main point is that now when I sum over permutations, it's not just permutations, but also negations where a K goes to minus K. Uh, and that's why you have so many more terms. So in uh, this epsilon P uh, changes sign at each such mutation. So either permutation or negation, then we pick up a sign. So that's the, the beta states now. And, um, oh, and then these coefficients are also more complicated because uh, they depend not only on the bulk S matrix, the one in the periodic chain, but also on the boundary S matrices. Basically what's happening is that these magnons reflect from the boundaries and there's an additional phase that enters, it's called the boundary S matrix. So it's a rather more complicated thing. We have many more terms. Before for the periodic chain, there were M factorial terms. Now there's that times two to the M for these negations. But nevertheless, um, oh, and one more thing, even though this is an example, we can also include boundary terms in the Hamiltonian. 
And we can also make it anisotropic. I just made it isotropic just for simplicity here. Uh, but, uh, but still the algorithm for the periodic chain can be uh, generalized to this case. And so what we did is we formulated a quantum circuit for preparing these beta states, but again, restricted to real beta roots. And uh, remarkably, we needed only m additional qubits to take into account these reflections. So altogether, the number of qubits in the, uh, that are needed is L for the system qubits, m squared for the permutations, and then 2m, m for the, for the faucet, and another m for these reflections. So this is the total. Uh, but again, this, this, uh, this algorithm is probabilistic. It's going to have the same problems that I showed you before. OK, so um, uh, just to conclude with a brief outlook. Um, so uh, I've described uh, some uh, quantum circuits for preparing beta states. Uh, and you've seen that these uh, circuits are probabilistic. Uh, and we've seen that, um, unfortunately, the success probability falls as 1 over m factorial. Um, so if you're interested in large values of m, um, they're not, they're not going to work. But small m is feasible. Um, also, these uh, algorithms were restricted to real beta roots. It would be interesting to extend them to uh, complex beta roots. This is still uh, an open problem. Um, and also uh, here, uh, uh, the algorithm was based on coordinate beta ansatz. Um, a natural question is, can you um, formulate algorithms based on instead algebraic beta ansatz, which is a, a, a very nice reformulation of beta's original solution? but algebraic. And uh, actually, there was a, a recent paper uh, that does just this, a uh, very nice paper by, by this group from Spain. Um, I haven't had um, too much time. I've been busy here um, but to, to, to study it carefully. But um, what, I, what I, I see is that it's un unlike the, um, uh, the algorithms I've described today that are probabilistic, uh, the algorithm here, based on algebraic beta ansatz, is deterministic. Um, so it doesn't it says, does success probability is one. Okay, so it doesn't have this problem. On the other hand, um, it uses something called uh, QR decomposition, uh, which is done classically, and and this is something that's hard to do. So it suggests that uh, this algorithm. Uh, also will not scale to large values of L or large values of M. So I, I think there is still work to do. Uh, and, and this is just for uh, rank one models. Uh, also, there's integrable models with higher rank. So this is totally uh, uh, open problem. Uh, and also, um, of course, creating eigenstates of Hamiltonians is an important problem in this quantum computing business. There have been other approaches that have been proposed, uh, things like uh, VQE, variational uh, quantum eigensolver. Um, uh, so it would be interesting to, to compare uh, the results obtained this way to, to obtain uh, results obtained um, using these other approaches. Uh, and one could go on, but uh, I think I'll stop here. So thank you very much. Thank you for a very nice talk. So now the talk is open to questions. And as usual, we welcome students to ask questions as well. I'm not a student, but may I ask a question nevertheless? Uh, we shall. <laughs> thank you. Merci. Uh, the, uh, so so this, 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 uh, this quantum algorithm, we, we agree that the way it stands would not be feasible at all for large M. But do you envision a sort of medium value of M, which would be small enough for the quantum algorithm to be reasonable, if we have a good enough quantum computer, of course, uh, whereas for those values of M, uh, we would be at complete loss classically? Yeah. I, uh, 
Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I haven't thought about it, so it's a good question, but I, I'm, I would say that already, I mean, M equals one is kind of simple for any, for, for classical, but already I think M equals two or three, I think could, uh, might be interesting. Um, no, but, but physics wise, I, I don't, you know, to be honest, I, I don't know. Uh, so it, it might be good, like for doing some kind of benchmarking to compare with, uh, you know, some other, some other approach, but, um, like, uh, like maybe one of these, but, but, um, but this would correspond either for Heisenberg or ferromagnetic or antiferromagnetic. In either case, it would be some excited state. So honestly, I, I don't know why you'd be interested in such a state, but, <laughs> but if you were interested in such a state, I think you could get it on a-, on no, a I, I, I understand I'm not, but what I am interested in is what quantum computers can do that we can't, don't know how to do classically. And I don't really care if that thing is so interesting. Oh, okay. Uh, then as, I... as long as it, as long as quantum computer can, can flex its muscles. So, okay. uh, but, but, but here again, e even if, if for M equals two or three, even if you could do it with a quantum computer of sufficient size, uh, because the probability of, of success would be non negligible, mm -hmm. still what you would obtain in case of success, it, it would be a, uh, the, the eigenstate as a physical system, not analytically. So what, what could you do with the, with the eigenstate if, if it's given physically? I mean, what, what yeah. we would, yeah. So I, I guess what, what people, people would probably want to have the, the analytic eigenstate as, as in here are all the parameters, but here what you would get is a quantum state whose, whose state is, is the eigenstate. Uh, and, and, and now if you measure it, you lose everything. So what would you do with so, it? So I it? tried, so that's what I, that, in the second part of the talk, that's what I tried to, to oh, I'm sorry. say that you could measure correlation functions. Uh, okay. I'm so sorry. you could measure, so I gave the example of two point correlation function, but you could calculate, you know, a 27 point correlation function, which, you know, math, you know, analytically you'd be dead, uh, but you could do it on a quantum computer. That's interesting, thank you. Thank you, thank you for the question. Yeah. Other questions? Well, I had a question, but you sort of answered it partially with uh, the paper by uh, Lopez and company. So, but the catch there you're saying is that they have to perform QR decomposition classically, which is uh, heavy as you increase system size. Um, do you have a feeling of the complexity of their algorithm compared to the one you were studying? Uh, you know, which which one should I implement if I want to study like low magnon? Uh, yeah, I can so say I, it's... as I mentioned, I, I I haven't had time really to study it carefully. My impression is that just like this algorithm, they can do M equal one perfectly, easily, but we can too. Um, so the question is is for for example for two and three. Uh, what could they do? And, and um, so um, my guess is that, uh, but especially I shouldn't be guessing on being recorded, but um, let's, but my guess is that if say you fixed L equals 40, that uh, that's something that maybe we could do and maybe they couldn't do, but I don't know. Um, I, I should study their paper carefully, so. Could, could I in your case have a little bit of confusion here? Yeah, my, John. my understanding of the beta ansatz is that uh, whether you use coordinate beta ansatz or algebraic beta ansatz or functional beta ansatz, these are all equivalent. They're not different. They're just different formulations. Uh, one is an algebraic one. The other one uses wave functions. And the third uses, well, uh, something more explicit. Uh, so I'm not quite sure. I mean, you couldn't get different results. It's the only the computational algorithms that are different, I guess. Right. Is that right? Right. Exactly. Exactly. But uh, but still, um, depending uh, on how which which approach you follow will will affect you know how how you write your algorithm, and um, so the algorithm the, the that these uh, that these Virginia Tech uh, uh, team came up with is very heavily uh, 
based on the this uh, coordinate beta ansatz approach. So this approach here, as far as I can understand, they 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 have operators that right that that um, which will act on on some ground state right, and this would be um, this would be uh, the the eigenstate, and so so these are some kind of uh, operators, and and I my understanding is that their algorithm um, uh, is for 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 creating these operators, which acting on this reference state would would give you uh, your eigenvectors, and these again correspond are related to the Ks. Actually, I think I, I may have put this formula somewhere. Uh, used to the Ks, these are basically the beta roots. So, but, but isn't, I mean, regardless of which approach you use, mm -hmm. isn't it in the end a problem of solving the beta equations and plugging it into the eigenvalues? Absolutely, absolutely. So it's the same equation. Same equations. Uh, not so sure the question, how the, you know. so the question, so, the, so, so in both, uh, this paper and the papers I described, the uh, the objective was to prepare this state, given given the use or given the case, and um, and so these are just two different approaches, and maybe there's a third approach which is better than better than both of them. Uh, I don't know. Well, there's also the of course the functional beta ansatz, but they all lead to the same equation. The functional Absolutely. beta ansatz is 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 very pretty because it looks really just like separation of variables in the Schrodinger equation. But it's just a different way to interpret the same thing. Okay, if 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 it gives you a if if you can make a quantum algorithm using functional beta ansatz that will give you um, a, a, the ve the beta vector in a way that scales that you can for large system size and large m, then you hit the jackpot. Uh, then then that's really that's really the the goal here. And said, I don't think any. It, hasn't been reached yet. Could I slip in, uh, William, I don't want to dominate. If there are other questions, then please go ahead. With it. But if not, I have one more to ask. You're the only one in queue, except me, so please. OK, the, this is sort of from a physics viewpoint. Uh, you said, I, I'm very intrigued, you said that people can actually uh, cre create in the lab a Heisenberg spin chain. Is that right? I mean, I'm a theorist, so but I, I I can dig up some references for you where they yes where they do that. So and are those finite and cyclic, or are they? Uh... Yeah, no, I, I think those are those are open chains. <laughs> in fact, so I, I think the idea is that um, so you, I think they make things like this some kind of a so they it's two dimensional, but so they make kind of like um. Uh, like strings or something, I want, but but they're separated. So the the interaction between uh, between neighboring strings is is small. Well, I, okay, I, I didn't draw the full picture, but uh, so in other words, the spins are here. So so I'm saying that the interactions here are strong. These interactions are very weak. So these are quasi one dimensional. Right, right. right. And uh, so. Uh, so actually, already for many years, they've been able to to manufacture these things, and they do, and they do experiments, um, all sorts of experiments to measure properties of of um, of of, um, of these spin chains, and they can. Said, but I, I I'm very uh, ignorant about these things, um, but I think they even do things like neutron scattering, right? So they'll take um, uh, where's that? They'll take some new, uh, neutrons and 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 they'll scatter it. Um, and uh, and these neutrons, they have spins and they interact with the spins here. And and um, and so the the pattern that you get from the diffraction it depends on the interaction. And and actually, you can you can kind of calculate uh, numerically from the spin chain. What you should get, and you can compare with the experiment, and the agreement is pretty good. So that's just one example of many things that um, you can try to compare experiment with with um, with theory, and it seems to work really well. That's so, so from an outsider. Is, okay, so the physical uh, spin chain is well modeled by the nearest neighbor Heisenberg Hall. Yeah. You know, there's also a Godin model, which is very similar, but it's not nearest neighbor; it's long range. 
but I don't yeah, know of any material corresponds to that. I, I don't know of any materials either. I can, but I can say that there's also, um, uh, so I didn't talk about XXZ, but uh, it's also materials that uh, are modeled by XXZ. Um, and these are spin a half and there's, um, yeah, for higher spin, I think it's more, it's more difficult, but um, to get the integrable ones, but, um, but yeah, I think there's a, a lot of, lot of experimental effort, um, but I'm, I'm not really knowledgeable about that. Thanks. Thank you. We have a question by Yuri Minar. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Sorry. Um, hi. Thanks for the talk. Um, I have like two related questions. One, you somewhat maybe answered in a negative way. So the two approaches you mentioned for preparing the Bethe states, one on the coordinate Bethe ansatz and the other one on the algebraic one, mm -hmm. they are limited, as you said, to small values of m. Mm -hmm. um, do you see uh, actually a way out? Because as the algorithms as they are, uh, it probably it's not going to work. But uh, do you see an extension? And a related question: There have been like proposals for say other algorithms, uh, uh, like uh, some quantum version uh, of Lanchos algorithm to preparing uh, quantum Lanchos algorithm. Hmm. Uh, so so some other approaches how to create uh, say eigenstates of uh, even excited uh, eigenstates of Hamiltonians. Can you maybe comment on this? How does it compare with you know, the algorithms you described? Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question, but I'm not sure I can add very much. So yeah, I'd love to, to know another algorithm which, which is better. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm still gonna continue trying. Uh, I think it's an interesting question, but, um, but I, I don't know. As far as I know, this is the most recent work. This just came out when I was here a few weeks ago. Uh, I, um, but I'm sure other people are thinking about this. So, um, and I will continue to think about this, but I don't know of any others. I, I don't see why not, but um, in principle, why, why one can't do it, but, uh, but for the moment uh, we don't have. And then the other one, I, I, I'm not familiar with this quantum Langshaus method. Uh, but I think probably you can include it in this dot, 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 that there's other approaches um, uh, that have been proposed for computing um, uh, eigenstates. So uh, the ones um, I'm, I know a little bit about are these variational approaches. So they're basically using the, the variational method we, we teach our students in quantum mechanics, right? You come up with some kind of trial wave function depending on some parameters. And well, actually, so what they do is, yeah, it's some kind of a hybrid, some kind of a hybrid classical uh, quantum calculation, which is also kind of what, what we're doing, right? Because what, uh, in the approach that I described, the, the, the beta states, the, the beta roots, the, the Ks were solved classically. So that's kind of the, the high, while the state was produce quantum mechanically. So that was also kind of hybrid. But in these VQE approaches, what happens is that um, you have some variational parameters and then you, 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 you use them to make your, your trial, uh, trial state, right? And then you, and uh, in, in Psi, and then you, you just compute this uh, expectation value. Uh, so this is a part that you do, uh, which is quantum. And then, uh, and then you, you, you adjust the uh, variational parameters classically, some kind of steepest descent or something like that to get a better estimate for the trial wave function. And then you, 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 keep, uh, you keep going um, uh, until, until you get a reasonable wave function. So this is not exact, right? So while the approaches here are sort of exact, uh, so, um, they're different, um, but um, so I don't know, but I, I don't know how uh, it would be interesting to compare um, how good one performs with the other and, and this, but I haven't done this. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. May I ask a question, please? Uh, yes, uh, of course. Yeah, uh, um, I'm very sorry. I, actually, I joined you. <laughs> 
just you know a few minutes ago but uh, for some reason i missed your seminar completely although i wanted to attend it my name is vladimir grisov i'm from the university of amsterdam uh, so a uh, question i had uh, is the following so why at all we are interested in creation of this better and the states in uh, quantum computing yeah so i i tried to give my answer was that um is so uh, we can talk about it later if you like but it was to compute um correlation functions so that was my idea that um to I compute see. a correlation function you need to know the state eigenstate and, and computing correlation functions is something difficult to do analytically. Uh, so, uh, so, so there was a chance that maybe you could use quantum computers to compute correlation functions. Yes, but uh, if you take any arbitrary model, right? So it, it's the same question, right? To compute uh, correlation function is it's extremely difficult, right? But but if you could create the state exactly like uh, we were trying to do, then you'd be able to get a very good estimate of the correlation function, uh, which I don't think you can do with these other methods. So for some generic model. Um, so what's nice about uh, these integrable integrable models is that you can you can go quite far and quite accurately, uh, which you, you cannot do. Uh, I mean, we were, with the simulator, we could get 1% precision pretty easily. And I, I don't think you can do that with, um, with generic uh, models and with generic uh, algorithms. Yes, but uh, suppose you have a non-integrable model and suppose you can simulate it in quantum computer. Can or cannot? I didn't hear. Can or cannot? You can. Can. Suppose okay. You can, yes. Mm -hmm. Suppose you include uh, next nearest coupling, for example, and then you compute the correlation function. Uh, correlation, yeah. Mm -hmm. Correlations as well. So, what would be the benefit of integrability? No, no, and uh, uh, no. If it's not um, if it's not integrable, then then of course you you wouldn't you wouldn't have access to you know these kinds of algorithms. You, you'd have to resort to some something like yeah variational approach or something like that. Okay. Uh, so the integrable ones are special, but said um, but I think I think you can in principle you can go much further and um, be, and exploit the integrability. Um, unfortunately, you can't do everything analytically, uh, and that's why I was thinking, we're hoping that maybe quantum computers can can take you the rest of the way, but um, but for the moment, not. Yeah, I, I'm sorry again because I missed uh, your talk. Uh, so why why is it so? Yeah, so yeah, we can talk, but um, but the the, the algorithm I, I I spend most of the time on is a, a probabilistic. Uh, oh. algorithm whose success probability falls as one over m factorial m being the number of magnons okay. Okay. so okay. Uh, so the probability of getting the state is very small if m is large okay. and okay. if you're interested in, a, in an anti-ferromagnetic anti ground state m is l over two half the system size and, and so and so you it's dead yeah i have a comment so because here you're getting the quantum state, which is a lot. You know, it's much more than the correlation functions of local operators. Right? You can compute anything you want. So perhaps since the algorithm is giving you so much, that's why it's so inefficient. But if you ask for less, say correlation functions, uh, sigma z, sigma z, mm -hmm. then perhaps one can tailor the quantum algorithm for that and that scale much better. You know, oh. require less shots and. But the full quantum state is uh, is a lot of you get a lot, so that's why it's costly, I guess. Maybe, yeah. But another question, just before we end, I mean, everyone is feel free to leave because we're way over time. But I, since you're here, I can't resist. So the other, um, so if you measure all zeros, you get the state you want. But how about the other things that you can measure? Sometimes are there are they all useless or? Um, 
Huh. You know, is there some, there must be some usefulness to some of the measurements because here you have to throw everything away except the, so is there something else or you it's haven't a great studied question. that? I never thought about it. Uh, I mean, offhand, I, I can't think of anything, but it would be great if you, if you could uh, get something from that. Um, yeah, I, I think one has to think harder, uh, but naively not. But but maybe there, maybe if one thinks hard, one can get something. I don't know. I, I'll try. Well, yeah. Yeah, a lot of open questions. I think. Uh, open. Yeah. Uh, and probably some collaboration between quantum formation people and physicists will be useful to designing like you know improved algorithms. I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> All right, well, I think it's a good time to thank Rafael for his great talk and for being patient with us with all the, the answers. Oh. Um. <laughs>